Yeah. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Let us start it. Uh, welcome to everyone to our BME seminar series hosted by Department of Biomedical Engineering at Columbia University. And my name is Chi Wen, and I'm associate professor here in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Today, we continue to offer this lecture in a hybrid format with both a virtual and a live audience. Our speaker will present for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. For our virtual audience throughout the presentation, please use Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and to submit your questions. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. For our live audience, you, we will have a chance to ask your questions during Q&A session as well. Okay, today we are excited to welcome Professor Josh Gold um, from University of Pennsylvania. Josh is a neuroscientist whose training includes studying mechanism of learning as undergrads with Mark Baer at Brown and graduate study with Eric Conson at Stanford and the mechanism of decision-making as a postdoc fellow with Mike Shadman, uh, not at the university, <laughs> at our university, okay. Um, Josh is currently a professor of neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania and where he combines his training experience into studies how learning and the decision uh, interacts in primate brain. He's also chair of neuroscience graduate group and co-director of the computational neuroscience initiative at UPenn and a senior editor of eLife. We had a lot of discussion yesterday at the dinner. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Gian. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many students. Um, uh, and I really look forward to um, 
let me just get this set up, uh, to talking and getting your questions. Um, as always, the, the purpose of a talk is to convey information. And so if there is, uh, if there's any issues with the information being conveyed, please ask questions. Um, I hope that uh, uh, you'll, you'll get to learn something from this talk. And, and I often, uh, or I would say always learn something from the questions that I get. So I, I really look forward to them. Um, so the, the, the big picture of what I'm interested in is understanding mechanisms of cognitive flexibility. Of course, cognitive flexibility is an enormous, uh, an enormously complicated topic. Uh, there are lots of ways of going about it. Um, I wanted to start my talk by, by sort of explaining a little bit of the history that I lean on in my work, and it really explains uh, the, the philosophy of our, of our approaches. And I put simply, it's that uh, for me to be able to make sense of any of these big questions, I personally need to start really simple. And the, the philosophy is to start with the simplest, most controlled paradigms and try to build up from there. There are, of course, lots of other ways of doing it and, and, and lots of other very useful approaches, including going the other directions and trying to understand uh, flexibility and, and, and uh, adaptive cognitive processing in all its glory. And instead, uh, what I want to continue to emphasize uh, in, in my talk today is that I think there's a lot to be learned by starting at a firm foundation and just trying to take the smallest steps that you still feel like you've got some understanding of, but it gives you new insights into where the flexibility comes from. And so with that, um, I, I wanna start with um, a, a famous experiment. I'm sure some of you have, have heard of, uh, many of you may not have, um, but it's part of a story that I think uh, draws some really instructive lessons. And so uh, this is a, uh, a paper from um, uh, you know, 80, 80 years ago now, pretty amazing. Um, and it was considered one of the foundational studies that at the time um, was a real sort of celebrated confirmation of one of the most important I, I, foundational sets of ideas of how perception works. And without getting into the details, um, the, the bottom line, so what's plotted here are um, on the x-axis, it's uh, it's basically um, the expected number of quanta that are being released by a very dim light source. Okay, and so sort of the, a, a measure of the, 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 the physical characteristics of a light that's being presented. And on the y-axis for three different human observers, it's just what's the probability that you would have detected that light? Okay, it's a really simple, very basic psychophysical task um, among the most basic kind you can have a detection task. Do you see it or, or don't you? And like many kinds of, of psychophysical tasks like this, where it's a yes, no answer, um, the, the typical form of the response looks like this, a so-called sigmoid, this S-shaped function, where at the smallest signal strength, the reports are basically at zero. At the highest signal strength, the reports are at 100%. And somewhere in between, there's this smooth function. Now, why is this interesting? because the function isn't just a descriptive function that fit the data. The function, so the, the points are the human response data, but the function is a mathematical description of the physical properties of the quanta being absorbed by the retina. And so it's a, it's a model that says that this is the predicted percentage of times that those quanta will actually reach the appropriate receptors in the retina. And so the thing that was really cool about this is that it sure looks like you can explain the, the cognitive behavior, the perceptual process of detection based on the physical properties of the stimulus, right? So the probability that you detect is basically equal to the probability that the stimulus would reach the eye. We're done, right? This was a part of a, a, a um, again, sort of considered very strong support for the so-called high threshold theory for, uh, for perception. And the idea in high threshold theory is that, yeah, there's noise in the brain, but it sort of exists in this realm that doesn't matter. And instead, there's a high threshold that describes our ability to perceive things only when there's a stimulus that, uh, that the, the response in the brain is greater than that threshold. 
right? And the, and the critical thing here is that because the threshold is so much higher conceptually than any representation of noise in the brain, then the limiting factor on perception is just the physical properties of the stimulus that allow it to, to uh, surpass the threshold or not, okay? And so this was a dominant paradigm in perception for many, many decades. Um, it, it, it may sound strange to you because it's not the, the dominant paradigm anymore. Now, why is it not the dominant paradigm? Well, it was just a few years later uh, when Horace Barlow, and if you don't know about Horace Barlow, you should go read a bunch of papers about Horace Barlow because Horace Barlow is amazing, um, uh, designed an experiment that really changed the way we think about uh, even these simplest processes. And so the experiment, remarkably simple, the ex basically the exact same experiment I showed you before, show a dim light, ask whether you saw it or not, but change one very small aspect of the experiment, which was simply the instruction to the subject about how confident they should be when they report that they saw it or not. And it was Barlow's intuition that that would matter, right? The detection isn't just about the physical properties of the stimulus reaching the eye, but it has something to do with also your internal criterion for uh, being willing to say that you saw it or not, because there's some ambiguity when things are really dim. And so under these two conditions, whether uh, the subject was instructed to report that they, uh, that they perceived it when it was either seen or it was possible they saw it or it was seen, you get different functions, right? And so here is, is really kind of the, the kernel of the idea that I'm talking about, right? A, 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 a visual detection task is about as simple an experimental paradigm as you can come up with. And yet even under these conditions, we can see that there are important cognitive modulations. You can change the instructions to the subject and it changes the thing that you're measuring. And so that's really the principle that I wanna build on uh, and, and that my lab has really built on. And so the, 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 um, the change that happened in the framing went from this high threshold theory um, to the idea that, uh, that I, I won't get into too many of the details to, to what's sort of now known as signal detection theory where it's not the case that perception only depends on stimuli that are above some threshold that's way above the noise, but rather that under many conditions, and sorry, there's an echo here and I just wanna not distract everything, um, uh, that, that, uh, that in fact, uh, what's turned out to be a more useful framing for thinking about even these simple tasks is the signal detection theory where the distributions of representations of a signal in the brain and noise in the brain can overlap and they can, uh, and they can be mistaken for each other. Uh, and so that's really become one of the, uh, the, 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 to me, one of the most useful foundational pieces of, of uh, perceptual uh, neuroscience that we've had over the last, over the last 50 years. Um, a more recent extension to that um, was uh, developed, I was just talking with she about Ken Britton. Uh, so a foundational paper from, uh, from Bill Newsom's lab uh, now, now um, 30 years ago, uh, again, just uh, indicating how old we all are. I met Ken actually when he was uh, at the Xerox machine. You all ask your parents what a Xerox machine is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when, he was, when he was Xeroxing copies of the Britain et al. paper they were about to send to the Journal of Neuroscience. That's when I met Ken. Uh, I was a grad student down the hall. Um, and this foundational paper basically, again, without getting into the details, um, took the, the abstract concepts of signal detection theory and brought them to the study of neural activity in the cortex. And so showing that distributions of responses of neurons in a part of the brain called the middle temporal area that I'll talk a bunch about today, uh, which has become famous uh, through, through Bill Newsom's work and, and others, uh, for um, uh, having neurons that are just remarkably beautiful at representing visual motion. And at some point, and this may not be true anymore, but uh, at some point was described as the brain area with the highest ratio of published papers to anatomical size uh, of, of anywhere in the brain. Uh, it's probably been taken over by some other, some other places, but a, a well study area um, and showing that distributions of responses in area MT 
followed predictions of signal detection theory where there were overlapping distributions under two conditions and understanding the perceptual sensitivity of the monkey could be done by, uh, by quantifying the degree of overlap of these distributions and the so-called um, uh, so uh, uh, neurometric function was designed to, to uh, quantify the, these neural effects in a way that can be compared to the psychometric function. And the ultimate take home message of this work was that individual neurons in the brain of a monkey doing a visual motion discrimination task the uh, characterizing the neural responses could be done in a way that matched almost exactly the, the sigmoid shaped psychometric function uh, uh, that you were measuring at the monkey at the same time. Um, the next extension of this idea uh, that's sort of relevant to, to this story is work that, that, that my old advisor, Mike Shadlin, now at Columbia, um, uh, it's part of the work that, that really that, that made his, him famous um, and that he's been building on ever since was uh, the, to me the next logical extension of signal detection theory. Now that we've recognized that signal and noise can interact in the brain in, in interesting and important ways, uh, the work that Mike did built on uh, theories uh, that, that have been around for a long time, but hadn't been as directly related to the brain, that says that, um, that, that a, a, a critically important aspect of distinguishing signal from noise in the kinds of tasks that are done is uh, you need to take into account the dimension of time. That, that all of these signals and noise exist over time. And so the ability to distinguish them necessarily depends on the ability to process them over time. And it turns out that thinking about how signal and noise are processed over time has given enormous leverage into our understanding of the underlying dynamics uh, of the decision process. And so instead of just characterizing the psychometric function, like I just showed you before, something like percent correct as a function of stimulus strength, you can under the right conditions uh, have a complementary measure of the so-called chronometric function, where you're measuring not just the probability of making a correct choice, but the amount of time it takes you. And under the right conditions, there can be very regular relationships between both the accuracy and the speed of your choice as a function of the strength of the stimulus or the, the, the signal to noise ratio really uh, of the stimulus that you're giving. And you get sort of these beautiful shaped functions. Um, these, are, these are real data from a real monkey doing a task that's similar to the original Newsom uh, uh, Britain motion detection, motion discrimination task, but now where the monkey has the liberty of, of, of indicating their choice when they're ready. And so that gives both a reaction time and a choice measure on each trial. And again, without getting into a lot of the details, the underlying formalism then changes. And instead of thinking of, of the process like signal detection theory, where there's basically a static representation of signal and noise, now we think about the signal and noise being somehow processed over time, forming what so uh, I'll be referring to as a decision variable that uh, under the simplest cases, and, and I'll talk about cases that aren't quite so simple, where it evolves over time by integrating the evidence that's represented in a form that's consistent with signal detection theory. And it's this evolving decision variable that makes predictions about both the choice and the amount of time needed to make that choice on a trial by trial basis. So based on this kind of process, we can model both the chronometric and psychometric function at the same time. And you get these results like this, which has made many of us super excited about things like this so-called drift diffusion model, because we can have a simple two-parameter model that allows us to, uh, to fit the chronometric data. So it's just fitting the function uh, that's described by this process. But then the really cool, super exciting thing, at least to those of us who get super excited about fitting models to data, um, that once we fit the, the, the free parameters of this model to the chronometric data, we can take the fit values of those parameters and ask how well they predict the choice data and it looks something like this. And so by simply uh, uh, matching the, the, the temporal, the time domain data, we can, uh, we can at the same time using the same process understand the choice data. And so once again, it's building on this very, very simple framework, but starting to recognize now that there is, even under these simple conditions, 
um, the necessity to bring in sort of the building blocks of flexible processing, right? So we've, we've talked about a flexible uh, decision criterion and now uh, we're talking about deliberation over time. And so these are the kinds of principles that my work has been building on to try to understand where the, the sort of foundational pieces of cognitive flexibility come from. So the overview of the, of the talk given, given that uh, introduction, um, so we started with high threshold theory and that gave way to signal detection theory, which gave way to, uh, I didn't give it the, the name that, that we often call sequential analysis, thinking about uh, uh, um, decision variables that evolve over time. What I'm gonna talk about in my talk are the, the, what we've worked on as the next steps in this process. Um, and so the main bulk of my talk will be what I refer to as adaptive evidence accumulation. So I, I sort of uh, very quickly went over this idea of accumulating evidence to account for the speed and accuracy of decisions. What I'm gonna talk about is work in my lab showing that that process itself is adaptive to the, the recent dynamics of the environment that you're in. And so it's giving us yet another window into uh, both the, the computational principles and the underlying neural mechanisms of flexibility. Uh, and then the last little bit, if I have time, uh, get into questions of how this flexibility translates to individual differences uh, in how uh, we and monkeys and other individuals uh, solve problems instead of thinking about these processes on average occurring uh, uh, with respect to some general model, I think we can, uh, the more we learn about flexibility, the more we have to focus on how individuals use that flexibility to solve problems. And so I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so uh, the way it's organized, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about theory. Uh, this is work that was done by a fantastic former postdoc, uh, Chris Glaze, uh, who's now gone on to bigger and better things. Uh, I'll then spend a bulk talking about our new recordings from this little tiny area MT uh, that's been uh, done by a current graduate student, Kara McGoy. Uh, and then finally, uh, if I get to the last little bit, some sort of uh, pupil measures and, and other sort of funny things that we can measure uh, that we think give us insight into this individual variability that was done by uh, another, uh, another fabulous postdoc, Alex Filippowitz. Um, Okay, so I, I mentioned this general process of, of um, the, the transition from signal detection theory to sequential analysis, uh, essentially in the, in the simplest form involves having a representation of, of signal and noise or of two different uh, possible signals that you're discriminating uh, between, but now adding a time domain to it. And the simplest way of doing it, it it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, this is one of those incredibly ubiquitous models that the, you know, as soon as you realize just how simple it is, you sort of wonder wh why everyone uses it so much. And it's, you know, the answer is sometimes simple is better. At its core, all the model is saying is that when you've got two noisy representations that are hard to distinguish and you have the luxury of perhaps taking some time to process them, that if you simply integrate signals from those uh, representations over time, you can do something that's effectively signal averaging and do better than you would if you didn't take as much time. And so it's really all about sort of improving the signal to noise of the process uh, of the underlying representation to allow you to, to um, maximize your ability to make good decisions. Um, and so it's that representation of the evidence that, that people found in MT. Um, and here I just wanted to, uh, uh, sort of uh, give credit where credit is due. Um, the, even in the earliest work, it's amazing how much intuition uh, Bill, and Ken, Bill Newsom and Ken Britton and, and, and Mike Shadlin, they all had about this. And as I said, in the original paper, we compiled these responses, responses of neurons into separate neuron and anti-neuron pools. And so the idea was, if you're showing a, a motion stimulus and the decision is decide whether the visual stimulus is moving either to the right or to the left. You can find neurons in area MT that are selective for rightward motion. You can find neurons in MT that are selective for leftward motion. For a rightward stimulus, they would consider the rightward sensitive neurons, the neurons and the leftward sensitive neurons, the anti-neurons. So they were always thinking about the opposing pools of neurons and how their activity might be used to make the decision. 
And, and they realized that there was a simple way of thinking about how this decision could be made. If you had rightward sensitive neurons and leftward sensitive neurons, and you played a uh, visual stimulus and you wanted to decide whether it was going rightward or leftward, a simple way of interpreting brain activity would be to just take the difference in the pooled activity of the rightward neurons versus the leftward neurons, right? And if there was more activity in the rightward neurons, you might think that the motion is rightward. And if there was more activity in the leftward neurons, you might think it was leftward. Um, well, it turns out that that's a remarkably, a remarkably good thing to do. And so one of the uh, papers that I published when I was in Mike's lab um, was showing that in fact, this simple difference in activity between the neurons and anti-neurons isn't just a kind of a nice thing to do, but it actually gives you exactly the decision variable that you can show mathematically will allow you to optimize your decision. So it turns out that it gives you a quantity uh, that is proportional to this thing called the logarithm of the likelihood ratio. And if that means something to you, then you can get all excited now. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then you can feel excited for me being excited about it, that it's actually central to, to, to something called the sequential probability ratio test, which many years before was shown to be the optimal way of solving a two alternative problem like this, uh, that this is the quantity that you want in order to maximize your accuracy. Uh, to make the decision. And it turns out that it, it, it seems as though the brain is actually computing that. Okay, so that's a really great sort of foundational piece that the brain is doing something um, more than just reasonable to solve this problem. Okay, and so the idea of the model now is that there's something in the brain that represents this quantity, the log to likelihood ratio. We integrate it over time, we get this evolving decision variable, and that can explain the speed and the accuracy of decisions, right? Um, so I wanna just unpack this a little bit, and, and I wanna go through now, and, and the reason I'm doing this is to show you that the ideas that are driving the experiments that I'm gonna show you in a little bit about a process of adaptive accumulation actually are predicted exactly from the same framework that was used to understand this sort of optimal form of decision making. And I just, like I always talk, tell, tell my class, I'm teaching a, st a statistics class and I'm trying to demystify it to all the students. And I say over and over, there's nothing magic about it. Like, you know, if you don't understand something, it seems like magic, it's me too. You know, when you, when you start a process and you don't know how it works and you don't know how the brain's doing it, like it's as, as uh, as was it Isaac Asimov said, that any technology that's advanced enough uh, that you don't understand it, then it's indistinguishable from magic, right? That's how we all feel when we're trying to understand something. And so there's something, there's something um, uh, you know, incredibly, uh, to me, rewarding when you dig down enough and you realize there's no magic there. Like it really is things that you can understand or there's a chance that, that there's parts of it that you can understand if you, if you sort of find the solid ground that you can stand on and build from there. And so I wanted to just sort of take the time and show you that the whole theory behind the, the data that I'm gonna show you a little bit is really based on the same principles that, that, we, uh, that, that we use to sort of understand this process. And so, um, so we have this thing, we have this quantity log likelihood ratio, which is this great quantity for making decisions. We're integrating it over time. To make it simple, instead of thinking about it, because I hate thinking about integrals and they're hard, I'm just gonna think about it as summing up discrete steps of it, okay? And so when we're, when we're accumulating log likelihood ratio, it's as if over time, we just get individual samples of this quantity and we're adding them together, okay? Or as, my, as Kara likes to say, each time you get one, you put it in a bucket and you're filling up a bucket. So that's our process of evidence accumulation, okay? Um, so this process is in fact the sequential probability ratio test and it's at the heart of so-called Bayesian logic, okay? So this, this thing, the, the reason again, why we like this, uh, this formalism is it's at, at the core of, uh, you know, I think the most powerful sort of probabilistic framework for understanding the optimality of decision-making. And again, if this is not familiar to you, don't worry. I just wanted to throw it in for those of you who are to, to say, again, there's, there's no magic of what I'm doing. This is all the most basic version of Bayes' rule for a two alternative task that we can get. And what we're talking about is 
accumulating the log likelihood ratio in order to get this thing called the log posterior odds, which is the thing you want to make the decision, okay? Um, there's this other funny part, the log prior odds, for those of you who are used to thinking about this thing, it's a funny little thing. Um, we're gonna assume it's zero to make everything easier. Um, there is work going on in my group uh, and with my collaborators that don't make that assumption just to make a quick pitch for it. Um, if you don't assume this is zero, what you're doing is you're biasing the conditions in some way so that independent of the sensory evidence that's coming in, there's some other reason that you might have for making a decision or not. And one of the things that um, my collaborators, particularly Long Ding, has done um, is show that if under the conditions where you provide this perceptual task, say is motion left or right, but then you introduce another uh, set of cues, and in this case in particular, it's you train the monkey to know that they still have to decide is motion left or to the right, but in a given block, if they make a rightward choice, they may get one drop of juice, but if they make a leftward choice and get it right, they'll get two drops of juice. So of course they're incentivized to make the leftward choice, but still they can only get the juice if they get it right. So somehow they have to balance their preference for getting two versus one drop of juice with still needing to accumulate the evidence in an appropriate way. And it turns out you can account for it using this framework as well. And there's a bunch of really great papers that, that Long and, and a bunch of our collaborators put together. Uh, and this also tells you what has been our favorite journal uh, also. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we set the experimental conditions, what I should have said, that it's zero. The question is, why do we assume that the log prior odds is zero? We can't always assume that it is, even if, even if we as the experimenters are setting the conditions so it should be zero, it may not be, but we try to set the conditions so that uh, it's, min it's minimal as possible. I'm, uh, my only point was we're, we're trying to minimize that so we can examine the other parts of it as well. Yep, thanks for the, thanks for the question. Okay. Okay, so we've simplified, okay, so sorry. Um, so now let's consider a, a really simple version of this where um, instead of uh, accumulating multiple pieces of evidence, let's just think of it as sort of a, one stage of the process. So our log posterior odds, or what I may refer to as our belief, is equal to the log prior odds plus this new piece of evidence that you have. So just another way of expressing the, um, the same process that I've talked about is um, you can think of this, and, 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 and in fact, this is the, the a way that originally Thomas Bayes described it in the original paper that was published after his death uh, several centuries ago as a process of how do you use evidence to update your belief about something? So this was, this was the original formulation. And the idea is that you can think of, you have your old belief, which is your old, um, your, your old prior odds. You have your new piece of evidence. That becomes your new belief. And then your new belief becomes your old belief that you add the new piece of evidence to, right? So it's just, it's just sort of, this is, I'm just reformulating the same idea that I had, but now thinking of it kind of as this, is this cyclic version of accumulating evidence, okay? Um, so here, here is the simple assumption that we are challenging in the work that I'm talking about. So as, as I've been saying all along, the, the philosophy has been, let's take the foundational piece that we feel like we understand and try to see where flexibility comes in. Where, where, where can we think about, just like, Barlow recognized that by changing the instructions, you can uncover mechanisms of flexibility in the simplest detection process. Right here, we have this simple update process that's at the heart of understanding the accumulation of evidence that's used for perceptual tasks, right? And where is it that we can understand where flexibility might be needed and therefore we can get some leverage into it? And the version of it that we were interested in was recognizing that there's this really strong assumption in the middle of this process that we certainly sort of took for granted until we thought about it more, which is 
in the idea that your new belief should be used as the old belief when the new evidence comes in is based on this assumption that the world didn't change, right? That as long as you're not getting any piece of evidence, then you should just hold your belief uh, and then move on from there. Of course. Yes, oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, good. So good point. The question is, what time scale are we talking about? We talk about the world changing. And the general answer is it probably changes over lots of time scales, right? What the data that I'll show you is it changing on the order of a second or so? And so it, 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 the, the, the formalism I'm showing you so far is agnostic as to what that time scale is. I, I personally think that the brain, uh, there's, there's been a growing understanding that, that there's multiple time scales represented in the brain. And I think that those time scales are there because they're matching the time scales over which the world does and does not change. And it could be, and, and when, when I think about sort of perceptual time scales, it's on the order of a second or less, and then sort of more cognitive time scales are longer. And I think both of those are gonna be relevant to this framework. I'm gonna be talking more about perceptual time scales for this. Um, okay, so we are simply considering the possibility that in this interval, the world did change. Right, and that will require some flexibility in this process. And the reason that we formulate it this way is because it gives us a very straightforward way of, of dealing with changes. And the reason is, and, and I didn't emphasize this enough at the beginning, um, but it's been throughout, I've been talking about these two alternative cases, right? The, 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 the detection task, was no, I didn't see it, or yes, I did see it. The motion discrimination task was it's left or right. In general, it's A or B, like I talk about here, right? The, the beauty about that framework for thinking about the world changing, the world only has two states. And so for it to change, like it's not that complicated. Like what I mean by changing is if it was A, if it changes, then now it's B. If it was B and it changes, now it's A. Right, and so what I really mean, so, and, and this is the exact example that I'll show you in a little bit, like in the motion discrimination task where the dots could be moving left or right, in the old version of this, which is actually consistent with how the task was always set up and how the, uh, and, and, and how the models were set up, was that the motion could be left or right, but there was basically a guarantee that for any given decision that you were making, the motion was either left or right and it wouldn't change. And that's why accumulating or integrating information over time was a perfectly reasonable thing to do because all you're doing is improving the signal to noise of some unchanging but noisy signal that you're getting from the world and you're always gonna do better. So what we're asking is a version of the this sort of now simple step forward saying, what happens if you can't make that assumption? And that in fact, the underlying state of the world can change. And it might be a really stupid thing to just integrate over time where sometimes it's gonna be moving left, sometimes it's gonna be moving right. And if you integrated all that together, you end up with mush or nothing or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, the, right. So, the question is, what can change? Can it be just A or B? Can the noise properties change? Absolutely. And those are totally things that we are starting to be interested in. Again, I want, uh, this is what I wanted to emphasize from the beginning. Like for me, it's baby steps. Like, can we understand, you know, one piece first and then go to the next and go to the next? But absolutely, it can change in many ways. Okay. Um, so, if it changes, that's all you need. Sorry if you didn't catch that, right? So, you know, if, if it changes, if it went from A to B or B to A, then in this formalism, you just have to make sure that you flip your ratio to take into account this new world, right? And without getting into the details, it turns out that there's a, there's a formal way of doing that. If again, another simplifying assumption, you know that there's some underlying rate or probability that it's gonna change at any given time. And we're gonna call that H for the hazard rate, 
um, sort of an interesting background of the math of that. All these were derived in industrial theory, and it's the, the rate at which the, a, a production line would break down uh, was sort of how all this stuff was understood. That's why it's called a hazard. Um, and in this case, we can, we can expand on our simple, it's still a simple model, but it now has this additional form of flexibility where it is, it is sort of automatically taking into account the possibility that the world is changing. And it should be, according to this formalism, adaptive to some understanding of the rate at which the world is changing. So that's what that H is, okay? Um, and so now we can say our change in belief isn't just the evidence, but it's the evidence plus this funny function of our old belief and the hazard rate. Okay, so let me give you some intuition for what this is. And this is gonna provide um, the predictions for, the, for the, the data that I'm gonna show you, okay? And so uh, as it shows on, uh, above, our change in belief equals our evidence plus some function of the old belief and hazard. So what we can do is we can look at the relationship between the old belief and the new belief, right? And that's gonna tell us the, the, the expected dynamics of this. And so let's consider a case where there's no evidence and the world does not change. This is the simplest version, right? This is the one we talked about where the world doesn't change. And so our new belief should always equal our old belief, right? And on this, uh, in this format, that's just shown up as the main diagonal, right? So we're always just gonna set our new belief equal to our old belief. If the world does not change, but we get new evidence, it's as if we're just shifting that upwards. Each new belief is just offset by some fixed amount of evidence that we got based on our, uh, based on our, uh, our evidence, right? And so this is the depiction of the old drift diffusion model. The world is not changing and we're just accumulating evidence by shifting it by the amount of evidence each time. You get more evidence, you shift it by more. Okay, so that's all the old version of it. The new, and so this is, would be considered, per, this is perfect integration. This is, again, why in a stable world, you should just integrate because it always improves signal to noise. This is what you should do, you're done, right? So now what happens when the world might change? And so here now the prediction is just based on the math of this. So now I'm just gonna consider the case where there's no evidence coming in and just what happens to this other term and how should you adjust your new belief based solely on your expectation that the world is changing? right? And it follows some pretty logical ideas that if you think that the world is changing with some small probability of 0.1, then you sort of adjust this a little bit. And, and the way I think of it is, uh, the easiest way to think of it is sort of is, is leaky integration. That what's happening is, if you think the world isn't totally stable, then you should be integrating over some time scale, but not over super long time scales, because the longer back you go, the more likely you are to be integrating information that's no longer relevant. Okay, and so leaky integrator in this depiction looks something like this. The more unstable the world is, the leakier it gets, right? Then you're at this interesting case where in, in, uh, in this discrete world where you're getting discrete piece, uh, evidence coming in at discrete times, if every time a piece of evidence comes in, it was 50-50 whether the world changed and there's only two states, that means you really have no idea what the state was last time. And so you should always just reset to zero. You should only pay attention to the new, you're no longer integrating, you're just sampling the evidence because there's nothing about the history that's useful to you. Uh, and then it flips in the other direction that uh, if the world is changing more often than it isn't, then you should actually be alternating your beliefs back and forth each time because that's what you're expecting the world is doing. So this makes pretty strong predictions about how beliefs should track expected statistics of changes in the environment. Um, and, uh, and so we measured this um, and we, we designed a task that, the, that we tried to sort of get at the principles as simple as possible. We have uh, two alternatives, A and B. These are two sources of noisy data. And in this case, they're creating data that are literally just samples from a Gaussian that are shown on the screen. They're two dimensional for reasons I won't get into. You only have to think about the horizontal dimension. Uh, the A is a Gaussian centered at where the A is. The B is a Gaussian centered where the B is. And the star is a sample picked from one of the Gaussians. It's a noisy piece of evidence 
from one of the two processes. And the task of the human observer was to say, given the piece of evidence, given the star, tell me which source it came from, okay? And the obvious thing was, is that if the star is closer to A, you should pick A. If it's closer to B, you should pick B. And that's exactly what the logarithm of the likelihood ratio tells you to do. So that's where that comes into it. The, the thing we played with here is without telling the subject, the underlying probability that the thing generating the star, either A or B, would, would, would flip on a given trial or not. And the times that those uh, understanding that flipping is most important, uh, it, it, which is the hazard rate, the time that it's most important is when you'd get ambiguous evidence, when the star was somewhere in the middle, right? In which case you should, your evidence is basically zero. And so we can test the extent to which people are or are not following these predictions of leaky versus non-leaky evidence accumulation. Um, and so here is, um, given the specific task conditions we use, it's the same kind of plot I showed you before, the new belief versus the old belief for three different hazard conditions, the low, medium, and high. This is in general what I showed you before. Um, I wanna get on to the next bit. Uh, so I won't go into too many details. We measured uh, behavior of, of I think 53 human subjects and we estimated the shape of these kernels from their raw data. Uh, and here's the data from the human subjects. And so this was our, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. So yes, yeah, so the star is a random, so, so you can think of, there's two Gaussians that are actually shown on the screen. Good question. Each trial is a random pick from one of the Gaussians. That's right, yeah, thanks. Um, and so, you know, we get lots of data and basically we, from the, mostly from the data where the star happened to show up somewhere in the middle, we can estimate the shape of their, of these choice kernels. And it, and it does a, it, it, it does a nice job of, of being predicted by the, by the model we have. So this is, this is the um, kind of our first evidence that people do something like adaptive evidence uh, accumulation according to this fairly simple framework that we showed. Yeah, cheese. It's a good question. The subject get feedback. Yeah, I was trying to sweep that under the rug. Um, it, 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 it turns out we did both. So we had, uh, we had conditions where they got feedback after every trial and we had conditions where they didn't get feedback. It turns out their behavior was pretty close. And the reason it's pretty close is the answer to your question. Because it was randomly picked and because of the way we set things up, there were lots and lots of trials where it was easy, where the, where the star showed up near one or the other. So it was as if they were getting feedback a lot of the time. And so I think that there wasn't a huge difference in terms of whether we explicitly gave them feedback or not. But that's another issue that we've sort of gotten into, yeah. And so with the, if the hazard rate, are they blocked? And does it matter how they're blocked because there's a the hazard rate? Yeah, good, good question. So, uh, so this was our 2015 paper. Oh, you can't even see it there. This was our 2015 paper. Uh, our 2018 paper asked that question. And it looks like I'm not gonna, I have some slides at the end that show that what happens uh, when you try to understand how they learn the underlying hazard rate when it changes across blocks. And that's the whole other sort of that, the individual differences story that I was gonna talk about, but don't have time for is all about that. And I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Um, okay, so let me, let me go through, this is the only one I'll have time for. I'll go through this, um, the electrophysiology part, trying to understand now um, where this adaptive evidence accumulation comes in. Um, okay, so I already told you about the, the left, right dots discrimination tasks or this classic task that's used. Um, the version that we used is, is our change point version of the task. So just like I said before, the standard version of the task, you decide dots are left or right, but it's set up so that on any given trial, the dots are either always left or always right. To put it in the framework of this change point task, we, 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 we broke that assumption and on any given trial, the dots could be could change directions, okay? And for again, various reasons that I, I don't really have time to get into, I'm happy to explain later. We used uh, these two fixed conditions. Oh, I, I picked the wrong, <laughs> shoot, sorry. Uh, I picked the wrong graphics, that's not useful. Um, these are supposed to be two different, two different switch rates. Uh, so within a trial, it either switched six times or that one should be, uh, sorry, 
That one should, be, it's the high switch rate, it switched six times before the choice and the low switch rate, it should, it switches twice or it switches once rather. So that it goes left and right and then test or left, right, left, right, left, right, test. Um, and and um, there, there are nuances and details of the timing, but essentially the monkeys should be paying attention. To all, the monkey's gonna do better if they pay attention all along. They don't know when the task is gonna end. And so uh, they should be doing this in order to maximize their performance, they should be doing something like this adaptive evidence accumulation. Okay. Um, so here's a depiction in, the, in the, the, the belief space that I showed you before uh, of what we would expect for this task. And just to give you a sense of the conditions we're using. So we have a, the low switch rate and the high switch rate, right? So the low switch rate should be something akin to slightly leaky evidence accumulation. The high switch rate should be something akin to more leaky evidence accumulation, okay? Based on the logic that I showed you before to map it into something that may be a little bit more intuitive and that'll match the data, you can think about how their performance should uh, depend on the length of time that they're integrating under the two conditions, right? And so um, under, for, for what I'm showing you here, again, there was the switching and then what we call the final epoch or the, or the test epoch at the end, which can have variable duration. And, and, and intuitively, right, something that is better accumulation should be something where the signal to noise improves more as a function of time. And so performance should get better and better as a function of time. With more leaky accumulation, you shouldn't see as much improvement over time because you're not doing as a good job of, of, of improving the signal to noise, right? So, the, so this is the prediction um, that under the under the low switch rate, you actually start off worse just after a switch because you're inappropriately accumulating information from the wrong direction. But the longer the time goes in this last epoch where things are not switching, the better you should end up doing, right? And then in the high switch rate condition, you start off better, but you end up worse because you're not integrating as well. So we always, in the lab, this is our crossover effect that we're always looking for. And my, and Kara gets really happy when the days that the monkey has a crossover effect and really sad the days that the monkey does not have a crossover effect. Um, okay. And so here is, um, actually in the 2015 paper we published, uh, we had human subjects doing this. And they had nice examples of this crossover effect. Um, as I just alluded to, uh, for the monkeys, there are plenty of sessions where they have this crossover effect and some sessions that don't, that will turn out to be useful and interesting in just a minute. Um, so what I wanna do now is focus on the monkey data. It turns out we collected the monkey data a little differently than the human data. We could get a more complete psychometric function. Um, it's kind of a funny psychometric function. Uh, uh, it, oh shoot, the bottom is, oh, it's, it's covering up just, all right, I'll have to explain this. So, uh, so the right side is everything I just showed you. So after a switch, the last duration performance, right? And, but now what I'm talking about, not just percent correct, but it's the percent that they chose the switched direction. Okay, but we can now unfold this and the negative times now are the conditions where at that same time, the final stimulus direction did not switch relative to just before it. And so the probability that the monkey chose the switch direction is super low. So we can just get these full psychometric functions this way. Yeah. It's, that's fine. Oh, I will in a second, sorry. Yes, I haven't done that yet. So yeah, sorry, this is eye movements. Yeah, 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 this is, this is behavior. Sorry, thanks. The question is how, how do they report this? Sorry, it's so I, I'm so ingrained in the field. It's always yeah. So for these for these monkeys doing this task, they fixate while the dot's showing, and then when we turn off the dot stimulus, we turn off the fixation point, and they make an eye movement to one of two targets, and that tells us their choice. Yeah, and so this is all just the behavioral data, and I'll get to the to the to the MT recordings in just a second. So anyway, I did all this just to say uh, this should have been intuitive from before, the metric that I'm gonna care about now is the steepness of this function, right? Which as I described before, 
is an indicator of essentially how efficiently and effectively they're integrating as a function of time. So the steeper this function is, the better they're integrating, the shallower it is, the worse they're doing, okay? And so with that, we can characterize the, the session by session data of the two monkeys, um, uh, Anubis and Cheetah. Um, and what you just, what I just wanna highlight here is so the, the y-axis is the steepness of the function at the low switch condition. And the x-axis is the sensitivity at the high switch condition. And remember better integration is steeper, right? And so most of the points are falling above the main diagonal. And so this is good, this is what we expected, right? So in both monkeys, the majority of sessions, they were doing better evidence accumulation under the conditions in which they could, but with some variability. So on average, statistically, there's more uh, for the low versus the high, but there's some variability that, uh, that will turn out to matter in just a little bit. I mean, this is, this is not atypical for monkeys <laughs> that, you know, when, when you read a paper with monkey data, it's often they show you the average performance over whatever 50 sessions. That doesn't mean that that's what they were doing each of the 50 sessions. It means that the, you know, the majority of time they might've done that, but you know, maybe this day they got in a fight with the monkey that they looked at across the room and were in a bad mood and wanted to take their bad mood out on the graduate student and did something totally opposite. Um, but so this is the kind of variability that we get, uh, but on average, they're doing what we expected. Okay, so th the last little bit and I'll finish up um, uh, just with the physiology. And so, so where does this come from in the brain? And so the, the, the standard model that, that we've been working on, the cartoon version of it, there's momentary evidence where there's some activity that goes up when the stimulus is on and then goes down when it's off. If we're gonna integrate that, we, we transform this step function into something like a ramp function, right? Um, a leaky version of this might just look like this, that the leak is occurring at the level of the integrator. And so you'd expect to see the sensory representation about the same, but the representation at the level of neural integration to be dependent on this, uh, on this adaptiveness. In fact, um, we and others have had papers uh, that sort of get at uh, questions of sort of what's going on in these higher order centers that doing the, uh, the, the evidence integration. Um, for various other reasons, we actually decided that we wanted to, 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 to zig when everyone might have expected us to zag or however you say it, um, that instead of looking at adaptive evidence integration at the level of evidence integration, um, we thought that there might be reasons to think that you could get something akin to adaptive evidence integration um, by adaptively changing the nature of the responses to the evidence. And I, uh, I'm being less careful with words that I should have. And in fact, what I'm describing here is what people traditionally refer to as sensory adaptation. So the fact that sensory responses are not constant, even for a constant input, but they change. What's not known, at least in cortex, is whether the nature of that sensory adaptation, if and how it depends on the recent history of the stimulus, in a way that's predicted by our decision model, right? I mean, that's the key thing, that it's not just that you should get um, this change in responses, but the nature of this change should depend on the expected rate of changing of the environment you're in, which is something that can be gleaned from the recent history uh, of the, of the um, input that you've seen. So, all right, so the, in the last little bit, let me just show you some cool data from MT that we're still in the middle of, uh, of, of analyzing, this is all, this is data uh, hot off the presses and analyzed uh, for the upcoming SFN uh, uh, conference. So this is, these are, these are figures that I've just seen in the last week or so. Um, so here's, a, you know, this is why we love to record from MT. So here's the example, a single neuron in area MT and one of the monkeys doing this task. What's shown here is a low switch rate condition where the original direction is in the preferred direction of this cell. So it goes high and then it goes low. And then at the time of the test stimulus, it goes high again um, because it, it switched back to pref. And you can see this sensory adaptation, right? These aren't step functions, but just has been classically described for MT, you get this initial transient and then it decays a little bit. And the thing we're interested in is there's something about that decay that depends on 
the recent history that is predicted by our model and is predictive of behavior. Okay, so here is what I'm showing here. This is the neuron's response for the low switch rate. Here's the same neuron's response for the high switch rate. The reason we set up the task like this, the amount of time in this um, pretest epoch that the neuron is seeing pref versus null motion is the same under the two conditions, but it's just happening under different patterns. In the low switch rate, it's pref and then null. In the high switch rate, it's pref, null, pref, null, pref, null. And you can see by eye at the end, the nature of the initial transient is very different under these cases, right? Uh, and that's the kind of effect we wanna see. Is there something about the nature of the sensory encoding? Remember at the end there, the thing to keep in mind, I wanna emphasize under these two conditions, the stimulus is exactly the same there. And the traditional view of sensory cortex is that it is encoding the thing that you are seeing. And what I'm showing you here is it is encoding not just the thing that you are seeing, but something about the history of what you just saw in a way that, as I will show you, is consistent with what we would expect of a system that is adaptively encoding the stimulus in a way that allows you to maximize your ability to make your decisions about. So here's the, I think I, so you can, you have the, the pref motion, the null motion, and I, I wanted to just highlight, right? So there's this big difference between the two. Um, we can take the um, summary of that and now look at the magnitude of the response at the test epoch for the low switch condition versus the high switch condition. And again, there's a lot of variability, but on, in sum over the population, there tends to be a bigger response to the low switch rate than the high switch rate condition, which is the effect that we saw there originally and which is what we, uh, what we were looking for. And so now to tie this to behavior, coming back, recall that that on average, the monkey was doing what we expected, but there were some sessions uh, that they did and some sessions that they didn't. So we can now divide the, uh, the data into sessions in which the monkey's behavior showed this adaptive integration effect and sessions in which it didn't. And so on the left are the, the, the average psychometric functions, again, where we selected the sessions that had this effect. So it's not surprising that the low switch rate condition is a steeper psychometric function than the uh, high switch rate condition. And here we see on average across all of the neurons recorded then, there's a pretty big difference between the response to the high switch, to the low switch rate versus the high switch rate condition. Um, and now if we take all of the other sessions where there's no behavioral effect, there's also no neural effect. And so that's, that's the beginning of our, uh, of, of our um, hopefully uh, understanding that there is some relationship between these uh, adaptive responses in cortex and the adaptive behavior that we see. So uh, I know I'm out of time now. So I'll just say that that's just one of several projects we're looking at this adaptive evidence accumulation we're recording from DLPFC. Uh, we've got recordings from uh, human, uh, 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 human epilepsy patients as well and trying to get a better understanding of all the places in the brain that represent this, uh, these kinds of signals. Uh, and so I won't get to the pupillometry stuff. Sorry, Alex. Um, uh, but thank you all for your attention and I welcome your questions. Did I just? Great. Okay, great. Well, great. So let me just um, quickly say uh, upcoming seminar is next week, uh, next week for Ian Knapp um, from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, thank you to our audience. I think we, uh, we're pretty low on time, but maybe I'll take one question from a student if any one student wants to uh, answer her question. I answered everybody's questions. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was a great talk. I mean, it needed uh. a lot of background and... Uh, Chi, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. Really she can be the one I'll do it. <laughs> so for the fast switch and the slow switch, I assume that the duration collision is fast. Is sorry, the duration say again? The duration of the direction is fast. The directions are yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the equal priors that I was, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, one real quick, yeah. Follow up on that. Okay. I'm sure you have like your, your actual parallels are a lot more involved than you know what to show. Could you comment a little bit for for us basically how you control for fatigue and you know potential compounds with perception or you know like is there so how how do you control for like the practical challenges of you know can you confounding all potential other aspects that you might yeah have. right the question is what are all, all the factors that can affect performance and how do we take them into account I I mean the short version is that uh, the monkeys are really good at doing this you know and and in a lot of ways it's the highlight of their day and and so um I, I you know our experiments run when they're willing to work so i mean the biggest control is they're kind of binary in that sense like they're working and working well or they won't work um you know i'm sure that there are fluctuations in arousal and you know those are the kinds of things uh that that she has shown and and we have shown you you know there there are potentially ways of measuring those things I find that those effects are pretty subtle compared to the kinds of things we're measuring. Um, uh, but that isn't to say that they, they might eventually be important. But in, in general, they just they perform pretty well on this task day after day. Okay, so let's uh, thank Professor Gordon.